Coming up next, the booking apologizes for not doing a real episode. Hey, Brandon. Hey, Nathan. Welcome to the Bookening. Hey, we welcome. Are, people might notice a vast drop in vocal quality right now. They might. And it's not just because Jake isn't here with his warm, wonderful voice. Nope. It's because, well, we're recording this on our iPhones, aren't we? We sure are. And basically, we're recording a mea culpa. Yes. About the fact that we're not going to actually continue our episode on literary theory today um we we are going to continue that in general but today we're kind of sort of taking a week off we wanted to give people a little content but what happened was one of the other podcasts that we share the equipment with took the equipment yep and went out of state with it it's a good podcast though good good reason for it to be gone yeah i'm not really complaining but we just didn't really plan well and here we are me and brandon have no equipment to actually record a podcast we're actually sitting out here finishing some cigars uh, provided by Little Anthony. That's right. People should know that they can go on Instagram and find us. You, you really should. And tell your friends about it. We're, we're, we have some fun on there. Yeah, at the Bookening on Instagram. It's fun. There's some good discussions there. And um, I like the people that kind of chime in and stuff. So Yeah, and we do these poetry videos that are our, not our response to, but our version of like what Close Reads is doing with their poem a day. Mm-hmm. So yeah, try and highlight some great poetry, and then over on Patreon, we we talk about it a little bit more. Yeah, it's just a lot of fun. So check us out on Instagram. Check us out on Patreon. You know what to do. Yeah, you can probably hear the wind blowing. I think my phone is picking up on some of that because I can see noises even when I'm not talking. So that must be the wind. Even when you're not talking. So that's a beautiful autumn day. It beautiful is beautiful day to sit outside and just talk about literature. Yeah. And so that's what we're going to do. I'm sorry that the vocal quality isn't up to the usual standards, but I thought we'd sit out here and just have a nice semi-apology for not doing a real episode. But also, let's talk about some literature, eh? Let's do it, eh? So, Brandon, yeah, what have you been reading lately? I know you teach and mm-hmm. read, and you know the booketing's not like the only place where you're still in your life reading books. So, what what texts have you been interrogating? And engaging with lately, Brandon. Oh, Nathan, I'm glad you asked that question. What text am I interrogating? What texts have you been interrogating lately, my friend? Well, I'm actually, so I have the opportunity this year to teach at a couple places. One is uh, still teaching AP Lit on a couple of days, averages out to actually about a day a week, really. But so we're, we're rereading um, To Kill a Mockingbird right now. It's a wonderful book to teach high school students the basics of literary analysis because it's easy to understand and yet there's a lot that's going on with character and image and development of themes in that book that is it's it's a powerful one to help students understand the process of analyzing literature and so that's really what I'm trying to do there is teach them how do you appreciate a great story like that so for example we just got through with a discussion of Mayella Yule last week which was a really good discussion because she's a fascinating character. There's a lot there dealing with the themes of isolation and hierarchies in society and our expectations for people and appearances and all that that is really wrapped up in her, in particular, her tragic figure. It ends up being a sad discussion for a lot of students because they realize that you know, their their tendency is to judge her and not like her. Mm-hmm. But once you really understand her as a character, she's one of the saddest figures in literary history, you know, abused by her father, wants this life that she can't have. She even, you know, the things that she's attracted to, she shouldn't be attracted to. And a lot of that's caused by the abuse that she's had, but also because she wants something beyond what even Atticus thinks that the Yules are allowed to have, mm-hmm. which is beauty. She has that little flower garden. She wants to be a mother to these children, and then she has the awful father of Bob Yule. So it's it's it, it, it 
it allows for some good discussions, probably in many ways, deeper discussions than these students have had. So it's, yeah, it's great. How do you draw a student out in a situation like that? Like what, what kind of questions are you asking? How, how do you walk the line of maybe asking, I guess I suppose you could go some directions that might not be appropriate for a high school student with that material. Yeah. Well, when you get close to those points, you just, you acknowledge that they're there without really going into those details, you know, and if any of those details do come out, you as the teacher want to be in control of it. You don't, in other words, you don't ask students. Okay. So here, in those cases, what you don't ask students is, you know, what do you think Bob Yule's doing to Mayella? <laughs> that would be a bad question. Yeah. And so you, as the teacher, have to be in control. If there are any teachers out there, and I think there are actually teachers out there, literature teachers who listen to the podcast. Um, I know on Instagram or on Twitter, we have one who follows us who yeah. gets excited by our tweets and stuff. And so for those, my advice would be to just always remember that you are the one in charge of the classroom. And the discussion goes where you want it to go. And if you do have students that want to make jokes about things, you just quickly silence it. And you point that student out, you address it, and you tell them, you know, we're not going to make jokes about those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And you show them that the classroom belongs to you, not to them. <clears throat> They're there to participate in your conversation, but the conversation belongs to you. Now, why is that? That sounds obvious. Brandon, why is that even worth saying? Well, because a lot of teachers will... Like in grad school, for example, when you have professors who want to treat you more as a peer, that, that makes sense. And so the best grad classes I had were where professors had authority in the room, but they still allowed you to say things and like that. But that's because you're a professor in training at that point. But for these students, they're there to be taught how to appreciate literature from you. And you are the authority in the classroom. None of them have the experience you have. You're the teacher for a reason. And you have to understand that because if you don't, then you're going to lose all your authority mm -hmm. and your students aren't going to want to listen to you. You may have a classroom that they all think is fun. I've seen that happen. You know, a lot of students claim that the teachers that they have the most fun with are the ones that just are laid back and just let whatever happens happen, takes them out to the octoball courts and all that. But that's not really, in the end, what students need. They need that strong presence in the room, the authority in the room that they know is not going to put up with certain things and is also going to guide discussion in a way that is profitable to them, which means you have to have a vision for what the class is as well and what you want to do with each class. Mm -hmm. So so how do you do, decide on that vision? Well, my vision for the students is always to just get them to understand the stories in a way that it goes beyond just the surface appreciation, but to actually ap appreciate the craft of what's happening in the story. And so you look at the elements... And you lay those out very clearly for them, you know. We have these ways. That, so I really emphasize the importance of having your definitions, your terms that you can handle, such as characters. And then what kind of characters can you have? Things that we don't really go to, uh, into detail in the bookending. We've talked about that, I think, in our philosophy of the bookending before. Mm -hmm. Of, you know, like flat characters, static characters, dynamic characters, all the uh, foils. What are, uh, but those are useful for students because that helps them to begin to appreciate the depth of what's happening in the story. So one of the best examples I have of this is when I taught Romeo and Juliet, we would look at the characters and we would look at motivation and we would look at the limitations of a play. You know, a play is not a novel. So what limitations are there? Well, you can't have the narrative voice, for example. You can't have the narrator telling you what to think about a character. On the other hand, what it does for you as an audience member is it requires you, if you're going to participate as you should, to understand motivation, to understand action. And to realize that the writer is going to use those things to tell you something about the characters. And so we did an extended an analysis of Romeo and came to the conclusion as a class that he was the villain. Hmm. It fits. It works. Because Juliet really is the tragic figure and Romeo really is the traditional villain there, drawing her into her fall. And the students only see that if you guide them to, if, through the discussion. So you, on the board, you put, you know, okay, here's Romeo, here's Juliet. Let's look at what they do. You tell, you know, don't give me impressions don't give me feelings just let's look at what they've done and so you start writing down their actions and that's what we did with Mayella too we wrote okay here's Mayella and then they'll start giving you like oh well, I just thought Mayella and I'm like, I don't care what you think I don't care what you feel unless you can back it up with actual evidence from the book mm -hmm. so you tell me what does Harper Lee say about Mayella and that's where you start to see oh well she points out the red flower garden okay that's interesting let's talk about why that's interesting well the author provides specific details and motivations to help you understand that character. 
And so you look at the flower garden. Well, Atticus Finch earlier on, he, he even said that Yules are always Yules. You know, they're not going to change. And that's what the community thinks of the Yules. Well, then you have Mayella, who's what we call an anomaly. So there's something called the bars analysis, which is binaries, anomalies, repetitions, and strands. And it's a useful way to help students realize, okay, well, here are these ideas that are binaries to one another. If an anomaly stands out from something that's either repeated or has been put at binary to other ideas, then you probably want to pay attention to that. She is an anomaly because she is supposed to be a Yule, and yet here she is being a mother to these children. She gives them money to go get ice cream. Yes, she does it so she can get them out of the house, so she can try to seduce Tom Robinson. Mm -hmm. But even there, you know, why is she trying to seduce him? Well, she's lonely, right? Mm -hmm. She's been abused, all these things. So there's just depth to the character that they're not going to see on the surface unless they're a gifted student. And you do have those students who... And I guess that's the other thing as a teacher. Without making it obvious to the class that you have certain students you know you can rely on to say good things, you still need to have those students in mind because you want to go to them and ask them questions, help them help the students who don't have that clear insight learn how to have those clear insights, you know. Mm -hmm. But again, that goes back to just having control of your room. What I try to tell other teachers is that you can lose that authority from day one. If you don't have it from day one, it's very hard to get it back. But yeah, asking those questions and then asking them to see details within the story. I mean, every good essay writer is someone who can find evidence and not just expostulate without evidence. You know, you don't want someone's impressions and just without them going back and finding real evidence. And so that's what you want to teach students is how to actually read and find the details that help back up their claims. Mm -hmm. Writing those on the board, finding details, finding motivations of characters that are actually in the text is what, I, is what I try to do with each class. And by the end, you usually have something that... So also one of the things I try to do is at the end of the class, you know, I'll start saying things like, you know, that could be a thesis statement and an essay right there because we've spent time with this character. We've realized things that are not obvious and now it's interesting. You would have to spend an essay developing those ideas into paragraphs where you say, okay, here's where I get that evidence. Here's what I think Harper Lee's doing. And here's what it says about the character. And so, yeah, that's kind of what I try to do with my class periods. Now I picture you, I've never, I've, I, I guess we, we co-taught a class or two together, but I've never actually been in a high school class with Brandon. I picture him folks. And I think you can have fun picturing him too, as like a, an Oxford sort of like if you ever saw Shadowlands, the the classroom scene where C.S. Lewis is like, Mr. Smith, we rely on facts, Mr. Smith. I, I picture Brandon as like pacing back and forward, maybe one of those pointer things in his hand and calling everyone, well, Miss Jones, I... That's actually pretty funny because I will call out students usually by their last name. Mm -hmm. I'll often say like, okay, Mr. Bailey or Miss Spady, what do you think? I don't know why, but it is something that I do in the classroom. But I do pace around a lot. I try to be active. Well, I guess the, my, the convoluted thing that I'm driving at is asking you, you've talked about classroom control and how to you need to maintain a classroom. But what what does that actually look like yeah. for you? What are the yeah, so, uh, th yeah, that's what I was going to – That's so what I do is I realize that the most the, – the, the tools I have, I have three. I have my authority and knowledge on the text, on the on literature. I have movement – so I try to move around quite a bit. One of my favorite teachers was Dr. Ron Pitcock, and he was always like, he was just so energetic. And he would walk around, he would pace, he would lecture, and he would raise his voice. And so that's the other tool you have is your voice. Mm -hmm. I often make the neighboring teachers mad because I'm loud. Mm -hmm. And I'd like my class to also be loud under my control. And so they'll like be, why, why were you so loud today? And it's not like it's out of control loudness, but it's, you want to get them excited. You want to see that you don't want them to feel intimidated to speak, but you also want them to know what you expect, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'll have students who'll say things and then I'll say, no, you know, well, where do you see that? You got to back that up with evidence. Like, and then you want to ask them the question, why as well? Like, okay, so you've said that. So why does it matter? Like, why did you go to that evidence? What's, what's, what's intriguing about that? And so knowing the right questions to ask. And a lot of teachers get like, they, they don't know what to do in those situations. But really, I would say your two most useful questions there are, what evidence do you see that backs that up? Once they provide that, or if they can't provide it, then you'll say, okay, well, then you're just making an unsubstantiated claim. Let's move on. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
And I will say those things. But you say, you don't say it in a way that's condescending in the bad way. It's condescending in the good way. You want them to realize that you expect more from them. And so, yeah, that's the other thing. As a teacher, you have to have expectations in the classroom. If you don't have those expectations, then your students aren't going to get anywhere, and they're not going to respect you, for one, because they'll see you as just as confused as they are. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that movement is really important, and your voice is really important. So moving back and forth, kind of pounding on the board, getting excited when someone says something good, intriguing, that you want to follow that rabbit trail a bit. Oh, let, me, let me play devil's advocate. Yeah. I want to be a teacher, but that's not me. Um, that's, that's, yeah. I kind of want to say, don't be a teacher. That's kind of, yeah. I mean, I mean I, that's I, probably too harsh, but. It is harsh. I would say that. There is a performative aspect to this. And if you can't give yourself to displaying and expressing energy and excitement about the material, what are you doing? How, how are we supposed to assume that this material is exciting and that you're excited about it if you can't. Yeah. Do something with your body or with your voice to show us. I mean, there is a, there is a performative aspect to it and people might not like to hear that, but there, it really is. And if you as a teacher are so caught up in your self image that you can't give yourself to helping the students be interested, mm -hmm. then yeah, you probably shouldn't be a teacher because you have to understand that your part of your job is to make them interested and excited about the material. And you have all the power to do that. And you also have the power to fail at that pretty miserably as well. So being excited yourself and being knowledgeable yourself is very important. Having control of the information, control of what you're teaching. That's why, you know, if you're, if you don't know anything about science, you don't want to be a science teacher. Right. Yeah. I think that people get, so with American education today, with the public schools, especially, we all think that, you know, as long as you have a textbook, you can, you can be a teacher. Like all you're there really to do is to just assign the students the textbook and then have them eat, read the information and learn it and then give them a test. You're not going to get anyone to really love learning in, in that way if you're not yourself interested. And you'll find that your students really respect and admire you if you do that. It's become very evident to me that that's the case because, not to toot my own horn here, but students tend to like me. I can so, support that claim. Um, and a lot of it has to do with it's exhausting work. I don't think people realize. So even outside of grading, that's what people typically think of as the difficult part of teaching is the grading. But really, the challenge is just committing yourself in the classroom to just giving your all to that material mm -hmm. and giving yourself to the students in a way that you're not so proud that you're unwilling to do things that might seem embarrassing. Like be energetic, be moving around, be like loud point out their flaws, address them directly, things like that. That's the other thing is if, so I also teach, uh, uh, fifth through seventh grade at a local school here. And one thing there that I try to do is you, you, you want to teach, but also have an eye to the room. And if you see any students who you see are either confused, if you see them confused, you want to step back and say, okay, let's take a step back and let's talk a bit more about that. If you see that they're kind of, um, losing interest, you say, Hey, you know, are you with me there? You, you, you following along and you just draw them out directly. You call them out by name. And pretty soon, if you do that to all the students, nobody's going to really feel too embarrassed or even if they are, as, as a teacher, you can't, you shouldn't care too much. You don't want to hurt their feelings by saying you're just a buffoon and lazy, <laughs> but you do want to make it like I, I had a student in AP who I had heard just didn't like poetry and therefore the teacher from the prior year had just taught, stopped teaching poetry. So I'm wrinkling my nose, folks. So the first time in class we did poetry, I, I made him read the poem. And I said, and I don't care if you don't like poetry. You're here in my class and we're going to read poetry. And so if you see students talking, you address them directly. You say, do you have something to share with the class? And then if they say, oh, no, then you say, well, I don't want you talking. When I'm talking, you pay attention to me. So you have to have that sort of control of your room. And you'll find that as you do that more, you won't have those issues as much. Mm -hmm. But if you don't do it, then students are going to talk. If you're not aware of your room, if you're only concerned about getting through your material, then you're going to lose students. And I guess that's the other thing is flexibility. I know when I talk to other teachers, some of them are surprised by this. Some of them aren't as surprised. But my teaching style is I rarely go into a classroom with a, with a plan. 
So I'll know kind of what I want to do that day, but it may change completely depending on the conversation the students have um, with me. And so flexibility and being able to adapt in the sit in, in the moment, that's very important. And I actually learned that from both of the two greatest teachers I ever had, Dr. Pitcock and Dr. Fairchild. Dr. Fairchild was a master of it. He would, he, I mean, he was a national book critic circle winning poet, you know, published in the New Yorker. All, he's like the poet's poet. And so when he came into the room, we knew that he had something to say and he knew he had something to say and he wasn't going to just let us get away with anything. He was going to tell us what we should think, but he was also going to help bring out what we should think. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And so he was a master of it. He, I mean, he could keep us enraptured with his discussions. He he once he was talking about poetic experience in life and how you can take those experiences and turn them into poetry. And he was telling a story about when he was in a um, a cabin with his wife out in West Texas, and they were watching a lightning storm move in over the. And his wife had cancer at the time, and so he kind of got teary-eyed thinking about it, but just talking about the, the beauty of that experience. And it was mm-hmm. like, that's really powerful. And it's, it's stuck with me. And it's not like there was a whole lot that I got out of it other than this guy has a lot of depth to him, and I should be listening to him. Mm-hmm. Well, that's one thing that I admire about you on the bookening. Not to toot our own horn too much, but since we're talking about technique, an interesting subject the teachers that i tend to respond to and the people that talk about subjects and are excited are the people who can just make associations and connect things to things in their own life or to experiences or even to movies or pop culture or the news where it's i mean i guess this just sounds as obvious as all get out but and when someone can find those points of personal connection and make them resonate for everyone we hear a lot about teachers unions and all that you know and teachers want more pay and i think teachers should be paid more i think that is a problem because i think that we we think of teachers in the wrong way we think of the job as being something you can just go and get an education degree and then do but there really is a certain type of person that should be a teacher and there are certain people who i think that our education system is full of that shouldn't be teachers they're not interested in teaching. What are they interested in? Well, I think they're interested in a paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what they're interested in. They're interested in, they thought that here's something that they like to do. And so it's something to do with their life. So they go in and they just give the facts to the kids and they think that's enough. And really that's not a teacher. You got to, th- teaching should be something beyond that. Teaching has to do with training the students to love the thing you're teaching about, right? When I was in high school, I had a wonderful science teacher and it wasn't because he was teaching us all the facts of science, but it was because he was really, really, he, he loved science actually. Yeah. And, and as an undergrad and to this day, actually, I'm still influenced by this guy. I took an astronomy course with a teacher who just absolutely loved everything about astronomy. And he was just, he wasn't a full professor. He was an assistant lecturer. Um, so, you know, he wasn't a research professor, so he wasn't one of the, you know, the big cats that everybody would want to take a class from, but he taught basic astronomy, but he just loved everything about astronomy and he loved to teach us these things. And to this day, I still love, you know, meteor showers and I love going out and seeing comets and stuff when they're, and it's a lot of that has to do with just his infusing that love of his subject into us. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. There's a feeling that you're evoking in me right now that I haven't thought of for a long time. And it's that feeling of just being spellbound in a sweaty classroom from about 1.30 p.m. to 3 p.m. You know, that late afternoon, your food is settling and someone holds court and you're just in a whole nother world. And I, I think of a quote, I don't know who, it's one of those Bartlett's famous quotations type quotes. There's no uninteresting subjects. There's only uninteresting people. Yeah. So a way to adapt that would be there are no uninteresting subjects, there are only uninteresting teachers. Or I would even change that to there are no uninteresting subjects, there are only unknowledgeable teachers who don't care. Mm -hmm. And so, and that really is what it comes down to as well, is the best teachers I've had are the teachers who are, if not masters of their field, you know, Fairchild is a rare exception. To this day, I'm, I'm very, I realize I was very fortunate to have Dr. Fairchild, but even Dr. Pitcock, you know, he wasn't seen as a master of rhetoric, but he loved what he taught and he was very knowledgeable. 
And he could take his knowledge and he could, like you said, make associations, do all these things for us that made it, made us realize there's more to this than we realized and that there's a reason he's the teacher and that we have a lot to learn from him. You want to be a part of a school that, and you want to have your kids in schools that value that, that value, that really think about, okay, who am I having teach the kids and why am I having them teach my kids? That's actually why a lot of homeschooling fails is because we all think that mothers can do that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But in the end, not um, every mother is equipped for that. No, like a shout out to my high school teacher. I went to a small classical school in this, in the basement of a lawyer's home. And the guy who taught us was kind of a Renaissance man who could make everything interesting. Mm -hmm. He could make Euclid's math interesting. Mm -hmm. And it was simply because he was brilliant. Yes. But he was also just very, very enthusiastic about teaching us these things. Mm -hmm. And even when he didn't know something as well, you know, he's a philosophy major. So when he would teach us literature, for example, he would still make it interesting to us because he was so interested in it. Yeah. It's it's just, I've observed this theory. The thing that actually made me say, let's do the booketing. The the reason that Warren Media went into podcasting, the thing that excited me and Jake originally was my observation that I really liked to listen to sports radio and I hate sports. I'm not interested in sports at all. I don't know anything about it. I don't know the stats. I don't know the personalities, but before there were phones and I could just listen to whatever I wanted, I would turn the radio away from music, away from my favorite music. And I'd find talk radio. I'd go to AM and a lot of times, you know, it'd either be like conservative blowhards, you know, your Rush Limbaugh's or whatever, or it would be sports radio. And just hearing people talk knowledgeably and enthusiastically about something that they loved was contagious and entertaining and fun and enlightening. And you could learn things from it, even if you didn't care about the subject at all. And it was infectious. And it is. And you'll get, as a teacher, it's very one of the most rewarding things you'll hear is when you hear from people, so I've heard this, for example, we have a guy, a friend of ours, who took a poetry class with us, who is now going on to get his law degree, and he came up and he told me that my poetry class, in all of his undergraduate experience, at IU and all these things, was his favorite thing. And it was simply because we made poetry, we made him love it, we made him realize something about this subject that he didn't know before. Mm Mm-hmm. He just, yeah, he thought that was great. And that's a, that, and so I also heard from a high school, from a high school student's parents. So I won't name the student because they didn't think that I would ever hear this. <laughs> but I heard that they said that, you know, they, what they loved about my class was that I finally made them love literature. Mm-hmm. And so, and that is the, I think that's the height of what a teacher should want to hear. It just, and again, it goes back to my point that you really should, as a parent, care about who's teaching your kids. Mm -hmm. If they're not getting that, then you should be worried. Now, of course, you have to know your kid. Maybe you just have a kid who's not interested in anything, and you shouldn't always second-guess the teacher against your child because that can be very harmful. Even with a bad teacher, your best thing is to say, well, they're still your teacher, and you need to do what they tell you. And you need to do your best to be interested. Yeah, let's not use this episode as an excuse to just complain about all the authority figures in our children's lives. It's a pretty easy thing to do. But as a parent... You should be looking for that. Yeah, it's, it's almost like the the value, the people who are the teachers in our lives are the people that inculcate our our loves and our desires for us more than the people that inculcate facts. Yeah, to go back to To Kill a Mockingbird, I mean, I think Harper Lee was saying something fairly profound about education with those early chapters where the teacher was not willing to... Oh, the dorky liberal. Yeah, liberal. she was not willing to live up to the expectations of Scout, mm-hmm. you know? Because she was actually trying to suppress that love that Scout had for reading and all those things. And Atticus, I think, had the response that parents should have. Mm-hmm. You know, well, we'll we'll do those things here at home, but you still should respect your teacher. Mm-hmm. And that's one of Atticus's wins as a father in that book. Yeah. But when I look back on my own education, I see a kid who was lazy, a kid who didn't want to give himself to things that don't didn't interest him, a kid that wasn't willing to just submit to authority. And I, I mourn those things. They had bad consequences in my life and it was wicked of me. And in so far as my parents and my pastors and people fought against them, I'm grateful. 
And insofar as I wasn't disciplined for those things, I wish I would have been disciplined more. That yeah. being said, it would have been nice to have a few more people who just said, Hey, I have a scout here. What can I do with this person? How can yeah. I take their innate interests and enthusiasm and creativity and put it to work in a controlled environment with discipline? Um, yep. And that, and that matters. And so I guess what I'd like to say to the teachers out there is that, well, the Bible says that not everybody should want to teach. I mean that as preachers, but I still think that that also applies to just teaching in general. Hmm because it's a heavy responsibility. You are, as the teacher, responsible for each student's enthusiasm and engagement. That's actually what I really love about our local school here at the church is that most of the teachers there, well, I shouldn't say most, all the teachers that I see there really are engaged with that. And that's what's going to inform their lives and stick with them. They're not going to remember Euclid's math, but they will remember your enthusiasm for it. And it will inform their enthusiasm when they go back and brush up on it. Yeah. And it's a heavy, it is a heavy burden. You have to realize that you bear those students. And that's one of the reasons that your authority in the classroom, it doesn't just matter so that you have control of your room. It matters because you have the responsibility of every student in that room. Mm -hmm. And if you don't realize that as a teacher, then you really are missing the point of why you're teaching in the first place. Every student in your classroom is your responsibility. Their engagement, their learning is your responsibility. And if you don't see that as a heavy and sometimes fearful burden, then you're missing the responsibility of what it means to be a teacher in the first place. So no, I, I think that our nation has really confused what teaching should be. Mm. Have all these unions wanting to protect the rights of the teachers, but in the end, do the teachers really do the things they need to do to deserve being a teacher in the first place? It's an honor to be a teacher and it's a heavy burden. So yeah. Well, let me ask you this, Brendan. I'm guessing that a lot of our listeners are in situations that are not perfect. Some of them are in situations probably that are ramshackle. No offense to any of our listeners, but just knowing conservative Christian communities, some of them probably go to Christian schools or classical schools that are less than perfect. Some of them are stuck with public schools or some of them are stuck with home schools. Well, let me ask you two questions. I'll, I'll tell you both and then you can take them as you will. Question number one, what would you say to the parents who are stuck with imperfect schools? Number two, what would you say to the teacher who maybe isn't the perfect keeper of knowledge and can't live up to what you just said, what you just prescribed, but is going to be doing it anyway? Yeah. To the parents, I would say Atticus Finch is actually a pretty good example here that what happens at home matters almost as much as what happens in the classroom. Mm -hmm. You bear a heavier responsibility than the teachers do as the keeper of your children's souls. And so if you see something lacking at school, then your home needs to fill the gap. I mean, Atticus read with Scout. You should be reading with your kids. Teach them that. Let's teach them what you see is lacking. And if you don't, it's because of laziness. And I say that fully acknowledging that it's a hard thing. I mean, I fell in that in many ways with my own kids. And so... And I think everybody does. But yeah, you have to keep that in mind. I, I think that's the answer there. Mm -hmm. is you, if you're in a, you can either try to find a different school. If you're in a community where you know you can go and find different situations, then you should feel the freedom to do that. You want to look for a school that values what you value and values those things in particular. I don't, want this, I don't want this just to turn into a love song to the school we have here at our church. Right. Right? They, they do value teachers there. Mm -hmm. And I really admire that about that school to teachers who feel that they don't have that knowledge, just looking at other teachers that I know feel that way, but we're still really good teachers. I think that what it comes down to, well, like Dr. Newton teaching us literature, even though he's a philosophy teacher, you could tell sometimes he was insecure having to teach, for example, me as a 16 year old boy who was reading war and peace and all these things, mm -hmm. right. That I really knew literature. And yet he still was the teacher and he could still guide discussion in such a way to make us all feel engaged and to make us all feel enthusiastic. And so really, the way you present yourself in class still matters. Mm -hmm. And so you still have to have the control as a teacher. And don't be intimidated by the students who are gifted, but know how to still use those students and rein them in, but also allow them the freedom to grow, you know, even if it's growing beyond you. Here's a, here's a little story from my life. I'm, I also was studying, I studied piano when I was in high school. 
and I was a good pianist. And I had a teacher who came from Brazil. He stayed with our family and he was teaching me piano. And I heard one day he came and he was talking to my parents and apparently somebody had told him like, Brandon's getting to the point where he's going to be better than you. How do you feel about that? <laughs> and his response was, well, I'm, I'm, I still have things to teach him and mm-hmm. I'm still the teacher, right? He's still my student. Right. And so I'm still going to teach him. Right. And if he gets better than me, great. That's like, that's the best thing a teacher can hope for there mm-hmm. is that they get to a point where they actually go beyond your abilities. That's fine. Don't be intimidated by that. Everybody's been given different gifts. So, um, still have that mindset that the classroom is yours and that you're there and you've been given that responsibility and don't get intimidated by what you think you don't know. Right. And, and I mean, let's be honest, a 45, a, a wise, godly 45 year olds summary judgments are often going to beat a very smart 16 year old who has gone deeper with the subject at hand. There are always things, things that you have to give simply by age, by experience, by whatever else. All right. One, one more question since we, this has become an episode on teaching. Yeah. It's not what we were expecting. No, no, no. I thought it was just going to be, what have you been reading, Brandon? How do you on that first day or two establish classroom control? You've talked about the importance of it. Now, how do you get from nothing to control? Well, you want to go into the classroom day one. You want to have your presence matters. How you, you know, if you seem fearful and unprepared, the students are going to see you as fearful and unprepared. So you want to go in and set the expectations for the class. You want to go in with your voice and with your presence and really just have control of it. You know, go in. This is actually something (laughs) I think... Just trying to tease out all the elements of my life that have helped me get here is that I got from my, so after the Brazilian pianist, I started taking lessons from a professor at TCU where I did my undergraduate work around the age of 15. And the first time I gave a recital at TCU, I went out and I looked like I didn't want to be on stage. Mm -hmm. And he said to me afterwards, I did fine in the performance, but he, he took me aside afterwards. He said, you did fine. He said, but what I was very disappointed in is you did not seem like when you went on stage that you wanted to be there. Yeah. And he said, even if you don't want to be there, you have to give the people the impression that you belong there. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that really matters for teaching too. Like you said earlier, it's a performance. Well, and especially it's a performance like, okay, maybe you don't, you, you want to just be yourself. You don't want to have to perform, commit to performing for that first day, commit to, to performing for the first five minutes, commit to coming in out of the gate with a persona and then that you can kind of shed that persona once you've established what's what, but there, I don't think there's any problem with being kind of mechanical about, I'm just going to act like Mr. Authority. And then I can, I can draw that back. I can let people them see the quote unquote real me as we go, but there's absolutely no reason to come in timid and shy and showing the quote unquote real you first. Yeah. And then you're going to have to make up for lost ground, and it's hard to do that, whereas it's relatively easy to ease off after you've yeah. established yourself. And if it helps at all for people to know, I mean, I, by nature, am timid and shy, so I've never wanted to be the student that has to speak, but I've learned that that's very important. And so actually, yeah, on day one, I'm, it, it's an intentional thing. You have to be very intentional about going in there and just establishing from the beginning what your classroom is going to be like, that you're in charge. And like I said, you're responsible for each student in the room. And that also means you're responsible for the students you know are going to be a problem. And you address them immediately. Mm -hmm. If you see there's a student who's a problem, then you want to let them know by asking them questions, calling them out from day one, that you know who they are. And you want all the other students to know that you know who they are, Mm -hmm. right? Because it helps. It helps them see, okay, here's a teacher. He's not going to put up with a goofball, right? right? He's not going to put up with the person trying to make jokes. He'll allow them to make jokes. Right, he'll draw out their best qualities, mm-hmm. but he's not going to allow them to control the room. Right, and if they try to, if they push back, then you tell them, "I want you to leave the room," or "I want you to go talk to the principal," or you know, mm-hmm. I, "I'm not going to have this." Or you say, "Okay, you know, class is over, Mister So and So, would you please stay behind and talk to me?" Because mm-hmm. then all the other students know, "Oh, yeah, he's going to be that kind." He done messed up, and so. Um, as someone who could be the class clown back in his educational days, there's nothing more uncomfortable than being allowed to be the class clown or watching other students be allowed to be. I mean, I think 
kids, both the rebellious and the non-rebellious, appreciate it when there's some controls in place. No, I think that's true. And so you have to have that presence in the room that really lets the students know that you're there, you're the teacher, and you're not going to put up with it. Mm -hmm. You also don't want to be, I mean, there can be, it's a really hard line to draw and you'll get better at it as you develop as a teacher because it can also come across as insecure. Mm -hmm. If all you do is all the time just be like, oh, you need to stop over there. And you, over there, you, you guys are just always talking, mm -hmm. right? You have your voice and you say, no, you're going to listen, mm -hmm. right? You, you point out and you say to the student back there who's joking, what are you talking about? Like, do you want to share with the room what you're talking about? Mm -hmm. You got my daughter over there. She's in my classroom sometimes. <laughs> We're talking about teaching on the bookening. And so you've been in my classrooms. Yeah. And like, if I have students that try to be a problem in the room, I'll, I'll address them directly. Uh, yeah. yeah. She says, yeah. She says, uh, yeah. And it helps to have a sense of control and it helps those students realize that they're not going to get away with it. She's nodding yes. Look nodding that. profusely. It went okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what I have to do in those situations, because I'm very, as our listeners know, jokey, self-deprecating kind of guy. I've had to teach myself if I'm leading a group, particularly of young people, not to lead with that. I'll say something serious to start, set that tone, and then I can be myself after that. But And if you've established your classes somewhere where you so... One of the things that I did with my AP Lang students is, you know, I, I tell them, we're going to be intense, but this is a fun flowing class. And they really liked that. And so actually a student ended up, a lot of students like to draw me pictures. Mm -hmm. And so one drew me a picture of the word fun, but it was like bleeding, mm -hmm. flowing. Flowing, yeah. Yeah. Nice. And so I put that on my wall. And one thing you have to realize is if you've set your s class up that way and the students start to have fun and they start to like talk and stuff, then you have to step back and say, okay, okay, guys, we're having fun now, but come on back here. Mm -hmm. Right. You. They're like sheep. You have to herd them back into the... Which is something that you you can do if you've laid a bedrock of authority and control. Whereas if you lay a bedrock... Uh, lay a bedrock, is that the right phrase? If you lay a foundation of fun, it's really hard to then build those controls on top of it. it so is. I think you just you just lead with the control and then you can have fun where, where, where you want to. Yeah. And I like my classes to be fun. I like them to be engaging. But I will do that occasionally. I'll say, okay, guys, you know, we need to come back now. Mm -hmm. Let's come back to me. Let's talk. And then the students will settle down and they'll listen and they'll be engaged. That, that really matters. <clears throat> you don't want to be like the hard times teachers either where with Dickens, where mm -hmm. it's all just about, you know, control because students aren't going to like that either. No, I think you, you establish control precisely so that you can relax and have fun and everyone can feel comfortable. Whereas if you don't, you know, I mean, we've all been there a million times. You, you, we've, we've all had these teachers who start out being fun. They want to be everyone's friend. And then they become the most tyrannical by the middle of the year because everyone's out of control and they're angry about it and they don't know what to do. And so they're just screeching and yep. you know, it's usually a woman teacher. And they don't, re they don't realize why it's happened, but it was all because of them. Yeah. If they just come in strong on day one, day two, They'd be fine, and and then they could have fun and be themselves. <laughs> don't don't take this metaphor too far, folks. But um, I did something really dorky and stupid, kind of stupid feeling at the beginning of my marriage. <laughs> we got married, and we got our we got home from our honeymoon, and I just thought, you know, I should. I'm supposed to be the head of this home. I should set some expectations. So I just said, like, here are the things I'd like you to do, darling. Let's have the a meal every day. You know, and I just laid out like all this stuff, and. I still feel stupid about that. Like it was so, uh, what's the word? Two dimensional and ham fisted and controlling and lame. And it's like half that stuff. I don't really care that much, but actually, interestingly, my wife is really thankful for that because she's like, at the end of the day, whether it was kind of cartoony or not, you did make it clear what you kind of wanted and what you expected and what you thought this was going to look like. And we've been able to modify it and go from there and establish what we both want but it didn't hurt anything in fact it greatly helped things for you to just start strong with something yep and so it was silly it's embarrassing for me to think about how you know i'm the husband i was at the time i'm not really ultimately sorry i did it and my wife is especially not sorry that i did it even though she can laugh with me about the silly way that i did it 
you know, often it'll feel embarrassing or strange to do these sorts of things. Actually, the Shakespeare's War of the Roses that we recently did is a good example of this. You can either act like a king or you can not act like a king. But once you stop acting like a king, then you're going to be a Richard VI or a mm-hmm. Richard II. But if from day one you're acting like a king, then you'll be a Henry V. Mm-hmm. And so it's a, very similar to being a teacher. From day one, you want to have that authority of being the teacher without being tyrannical about it. Because if you do that, then the students are going to be miserable in your classroom. Mm-hmm. But I would almost say err in the direction of tyrannical for the for day one, because you can always pull back and adapt and become looser. But it's really hard once you've established looseness to to get it back to, be, to become harder. Yeah. No, yeah, it is. When, and once you've lost it, it's very difficult to regain it. Mm-hmm. So, and I've seen that over and over again with teachers wondering, oh, why don't the students ever listen in my classroom? Like, it's because they know they don't have to. Yeah. For example, one of the classes in uh, one of the places I teach was known for being the bad class that doesn't listen. Mm-hmm. I never had those problems. And it's because they knew that they were going to get away with it. Yeah. So, yeah. And they actually ended up being one of my favorite classes. So, Those same kids. Yeah. There you go, folks. Just ask yourself, WWBD. Yeah. Yeah, ask yourself that. <laughs> what would Brandon That's do? That's been the whole point of this. <laughs> <laughs> I am the paragon. <laughs> No, you're not the paragon, but you've had a good experience. I can I can attest that Brandon's a very good teacher. Kids respect him, and they really like him. So I am a helper, uh, a youth leader at our youth group, and they're always talking about Mr. Chastine, the ones that goes to the schools where Brandon teach. You know, if they, if, they, if I, and, and they don't, some of them know that I'm Mr. Albertson works with Mr. Chastine, but a lot of them don't. And I'll just say, you know, who do you like? And you know, they'll complain about Mr. So and So or Mrs. So and So, but. They always say that, so not to puff Brandon up too much, but he's a good teacher. And I guess one last thing to say would be not to not to despair when you have those students that don't seem to care. Mm-hmm. You're going to have those students occasionally. Just have your eye on that student and know that you can't win them all. Yeah. There are some people that an important part of leadership is triage and understanding and being okay with, well, this one's lost. Yeah. actually. And and you don't make that decision lightly or easily or just blow off. Uh, well, that person is difficult, so I'm not going to do anything. But there are people where you say, okay, I'm controlling this. This I'm keeping this from affecting others. But what I'm not doing is actually caring about this person because it's a fool's errand. Yep. You just need to be honest about what you're going for. I guess we could do donor shout outs real quick. We've accidentally did a whole episode. This was supposed to be a mea culpa. Yeah. All right. Why don't I read the donors and you say the first word that pops into your mind? Robert and Rhonda the Lovebirds. Mom and Dad. (laughs) The Artful Anthony Dodger. uh, Scotch. Little Anthony Cigar Store. Cigars. The Immortal Chelsea E. Immortality. Jimmy Beam and Little Annie Oakley. Salmon. Lily of the Valley. Lilies. Anthony the Lovebirds. Uh, Friends. The Keith Master. Computers. <laughs> David's Mighty Men Tricking. Tricking. John, John Jill and Little Baby Max. Brothers. Jane and Katie who are cold and love cheese and also C.S. Lewis until, including Until We Have Faces. The best. Fairy Princess of Wonder and Happiness. Mothers. Mother Beth. Sorry. Mothers. Console Prime Adam. Star Wars. <laughs> Jeremy the Dark Hooded Lord of Death. Uh, awesomeness. <laughs> Nathan Not Me. Uh, uh, books. Maya! Maya! Um, hair. Right, the Red <laughs> Vendor and Judith of the Ladies of Justice. Uh, Jedi's. Danny the Dude. Dinosaurs. There's a Danny to the dinosaur, right? There's a Danny. Uh, DJ Sammy G. DJ's music. Benny and Danny Tiberius. Roman consulates. Eric and Catherine from Yawn Window Breaks. They were the ones I was thinking of. Yes. Siblings. Professor and Lady X. Knowledge. Lavender's green, Dylan, Dylan. Lavender's blue. Lavender's green, Dylan, Dylan. I love you too. Uh, music. No constrictor. Boas. <laughs> Mara Cheap. C.S. Lewis. The Fair and Fragrant Maiden Chloe. Flowers. Anthony, who is cold and hates life, liberty, and the pursuit of cheese. Sadness. <laughs> <laughs> Jujitsu Jeffrey, the Texas Ranger. Walker. Rachel. Rachel. Midnight and... Oh, whispers. Whispers, yeah. Midnight and the Angel. Ellen. Sorry. Uh, the Matrix. Queen can get a... Shakespeare. <laughs> Return of the Jedediah. I guess that's more like Star Wars there. George Jay, Lucas. Jay Rack and Ruin. Doom. T- Timothy the Writer at Dawn. Morning. 
Eric and Tate, the Camp Jam Kings, who are warm and love bees. Uh, summer. Maddie, Maddie, Matt, man. Batman. <laughs> Sweet Sun- Jamie Sunshine. Warmth. Tyler, the Keeper of Eternal Darkness, and Laura, the Keeper of Eternal Light. The Arcane. <laughs> Cold Steel Cody. Cowboy. Jacqueline, the Librarian Barbarian. Books. John Bombadilla, Bomb Diggity, and Captain Tennille, his mate. Tolkien. Saxophone Alex. Saxophones. <laughs> Eli, the Scarlet Pilgrim. Um, Wanderer. Saxophone Alex Part 2, the other Saxophone Alex, and a Dubstep Adene. Hank of the Christie. <laughs> Ryan, Ryan, the Terror of Texas, and Eric of the Cream and Crimson, who are stuck in the cold. Please send cheese. Home. Home. Well, there you go. Thanks for listening, folks. Support us at patreon.com forward slash the booking. We'll be back next week, hopefully with better audio quality. Hope you enjoyed this episode. I did. Me too. Bye. Bye. <laughs>